Good morning, and welcome to another Bible study here at Hurricane Baptist Church. I want to apologize for the last two weeks we've been was gone, and then sickness and all kinds of things happened, so I won't go into all of it, but we just didn't get anything done for the last two weeks. So we're going to try to pick it up and maybe get back on a better schedule where we can keep each morning and, and Wednesday night have something for you to, to watch if you're, if you're interested in the Bible studies that we've been going through. We're in uh, Psalms. I've been studying the Psalms for quite a while now. We're in Psalm 51, and, and the last time we got together, we just got started in the Psalm. We did a introduction to uh, Psalm 51, and then we did a got started into the verse by verse, and we got through the first three verses, and uh, he got down to uh, chapter 51 and, and verse 3. He said, For I acknowledge, David's talking here, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. So he's it's not something that he's pushed his sin out of the way. He's been going on, it's just been about, it was about a year from the time that he, all the things happened. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, God confronted him using the, the prophet Nathan. And so from that time, then David's really been struggling. We don't know what happened, how much it bothered him before that, but we know from that time on, he was bothered by what he did. And so we get to this psalm he wrote. <clears throat> also, I think Psalm 32 kind of goes along with this. But anyway, we're down through... Uh, the first three verses. So we get into verse number four. And he says, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. <clears throat> so I hang up with my voice this morning. But uh, So he's talking, starts with that first half of the voice, that verse. He says, Against thee, and thee only, have I sinned. So he's recognizing that the, the sin is against God. Now we know that also he sinned against Uriah, he sinned against Bathsheba, and everybody that really trusted him in that. But uh, he's not denying that. It's not that he's putting, trying to forget about it. But he's saying that the important thing was, the, the big thing was, I sinned against God. And that shows us that, um, as we talk about David many times being a man after God's own heart, we see that understanding that what's really important in his life is that, uh, that relationship, that fellowship with God. <laughs> so, uh, this uh, uh, kind of a re reminder on that, or maybe some illustration. We can look over to Genesis uh, chapter 39 and uh, verse 8 and 9. If over there we see that uh, uh, Joseph, he's in, uh, been captured, you know, been taken by his brothers, and we read that story, and then they sold him and he went to Egypt. He's in Potiphar's house, and uh, how he's being tempted by uh, Potiphar's wife and that. So, uh, we get down to chapter 39, verses 8 and 9. It says, but Joseph, but he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not, I, wanteth not what is with me in his house, and hath committed all that he hath to my hand. He said, You know, he's really trusting me with everything. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. So he said, Potiphar's giving him the run of the house. Joseph, you have, you're in charge of everything. You take care of it. You know, leave my wife alone, but uh, the rest of it you're in control of. And so we see he recognized that, but he says, uh, you've, he's held you back because you're his wife. But how then, he says, can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Uh, he realizes that if he did have an uh, involvement with uh, Potiphar's wife, it would be a sin against Potiphar. But he says, you know what, it's, it's a greater sin that I would do this against my God. So that recognizing the value of that relationship. And I think sometimes um, as Christians, we, we kind of pass over how important it is as we commit sin and that we uh, maybe get involved with other people and harm and hurt other people. But again, it's God's, uh, we're His, it's His family, it's His, we're the body of Christ, and <laughs> we kind of take it for granted who He is and, and how He loves us. And David goes a little bit farther here, and he shows us that... Uh, how he understands his responsibility to God. And he goes, because he says, you know, at the end here, we'll read this, he says, that you might be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And so he says, God, you know what I did. And you're going to judge me. But he said, I know that you're fair. I know that I will get what I deserve according to your standard. Well, we know that David deserved to die. He had Uriah killed. He committed murder, basically. It's like he had somebody else do it, but he, he ordered it. So he actually killed Uriah. He had an affair with Bathsheba, no doubt about that. So he deserved to die. So Nathan had told him, he said, well, you know, you're not going to die. The child's going to die, but you're not going to die. But uh, 
David says, no matter what you do now, Lord, he says, I know that that's your affair. You deserve whatever consequences God determines. You and I, as we do things in life, we're the same boat. We just have to trust him, and he's going to use, use consequences to bring us back. God is always just. He wants to punish sin, but also, never forget, he wants to restore the sinner. Uh, he's got to punish. You know, sometimes as parents, uh, you may, your child may do something and it may, may be halfway cute and that, you know, but you know that you can't let it go because it's something that's going to maybe get worse than that. So you have to discipline your child, take something away from them or what it must be done. But the idea is you have to do it anyway because you, you love them, and you want to, but you want to restore that, that fellowship. You want to restore that to what fellowship you have with them. Over in uh, Romans uh, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, he says this, He's talking about at the end of chapter 1 and beginning verse uh, chapter 2. He's talking about people that judge other people. Uh, you know, you look at these people and they're sinning, they're doing this. He says, but you're doing the same thing. And maybe not the same exact sin, but you're still sinning. You're still being a hypocrite. And so we get down to verses 3 and 4. He says, Thinkest thou, thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them that, that which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? You think you're better than they are? Oh, you're more spiritual, or you're more upright, or whatever. So you think you're going to get by with it? Or despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? In other words, God is long suffering. He forbears. He holds back judgment. He said, "You're kind of taking advantage of him." Is what you're trying to do here? He said, "And knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance." God's whole purpose is to lead you to repentance, whether it be uh, allowing things to happen and seeing you, you see the consequence, so you repent, or bringing consequences into the picture, so you repent. And so the idea is that God's always wanting to bring you back. He's never wanting you to drive you away. So let's go a little bit further, and we get down here to verse number 5. It says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So the idea here is that... Uh, we have that sin nature no matter what happens. When you're formed in the womb, when your, your mother gets pregnant and she buried, carries you for the nine months, but you're, being, you're in that sin nature already. You have that. That's not something you acquire. You already have that when you're, when you're born as, a, as an individual. He tells us over in Romans 3.23, he says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So I, I use this verse a lot of times when I'm talking to someone, but I always kind of emphasize the fact, you know, I'm... Sometimes people get when say, offended. Oh, you're calling me a sinner. No, I say, but all have sinned. I've sinned. You sinned. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. So we all need to be forgiven. We all need to be cleansed. And so the idea is he's telling us right here. He says that, that uh, we've sinned. We've inherited that sin nature. And how did that come about? How did we inherit that sin nature? I'm going to look at a couple verses here real quick uh, over in Romans 12. I've Chapter 5, verse 12, he says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So we know where that came from, didn't we? Adam and Eve. So we go down to verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, here we go, it's the good side of the story, for by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And so we know the difference between Adam and the first Adam and the second Adam. Adam from the Garden of Eden, the second Adam, Jesus Christ. So you need to have that relationship, though, right? I, I just backed up a little bit to Romans 3.23. All have sinned. You've sinned. I've sinned. But you know the difference? If you're not born again, if you're not born into the family of God, we all sin and have sinned. But that is, I've been forgiven. I, I'm not facing the consequences for my sin as far as eternity. The wages of sin is death. I deserve to die for my sin, but to faith and trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, God took away that condemnation and replaced that with His love, and I now have that relationship with the Father through the Son. So if you want to have that, you need to repent. You need to turn to God and put your faith and trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you so much, He sent His Son to the cross to die for you. And so today is the day. Turn to Him and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from unrighteousness. Now, however words you want to use, but you want to be forgiven, and it comes from the heart. I'm believing that your word is true, and your Son has paid the price for my sin. I'm trusting in Him and Him alone for my salvation. Save me, and He will do it. You'll be born into the family of God. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for this day and for this time. We just pray you'd be with each one of us, that we would be living the kind of life that we show that you're, you're uh, you're so valuable to us. You're, 
You're so important, Lord, we, we recognize your power and your presence, and we need to have more, a greater reverence for you, a greater love for you. So work in our hearts and lives. Give us a heart like David had, that we understand that we do wrong. Not only do we hurt people, but we hurt you. And we just thank you for loving us anyway. We'll take whatever you have to send at us to get us where we need to be. And we'll praise you for all that in Jesus' name. Amen.